Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Susanna Doyle. I'm the Alumni Relations Manager at Trinity Development and Alumni, and you're all very welcome to this week's Inspiring Ideas at Trinity webinar. We are delighted to discuss today Trinity in Translation, Connecting Cultures Through the Centuries with our guest speakers, Professor Michael Cronin, the Professor of French and Director of the Trinity Center for Literary and Cultural Translation at Trinity College Dublin, as well as Associate Professor Carol O'Sullivan, Director of Translation Studies at the University of Bristol and alumna of Trinity. The talk today will last about 50 minutes, uh, which will include time for audience participation. So please feel free to send through your questions using the QA button on the bottom of your screen at any time throughout the webinar. In addition, we are using Zoom generated automatic subtitles for this webinar. To turn these subtitles on or off, uh, please click on the CC closed caption button on the bottom of your screen and click show or hide the subtitles. In addition, I wanted to let you know that this is being recorded um, and will be available for later viewing on our YouTube channel. Now I'd like to introduce Carol O'Sullivan. She studied Italian and French at Trinity College Dublin. She's an alumna here where she was the foundation scholar. Through TCD's exchange schemes, she also was able to study at the Universities of Pavia and Trieste in Italy. She did her graduate studies at Cambridge and is currently Associate Professor in Translation Studies at the University of Bristol. Her research interests include translation history, especially the history of film translation, subtitling, library translation, and paratext. Her most recent book is The Translation of Films, 1900 to 1950, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2019 and was co-edited with Jean-Francois Cornu. So I'll stop sharing my screen and hand over to you, Carol. Thank you very much, Susanna. And thank you for the invitation to uh, participate in this webinar, um, which I was absolutely thrilled to get. And I'm delighted to um, be able to be speaking today to Professor Michael Cronin, who has been a colleague of many years standing and also um, somebody whose work I've admired for a very, very long time. Um, Michael, or Miholo Cronin, to give him his name, Osquelga, holds the Chair of French 1776 in Trinity. Uh, he's been a leading figure in translation studies research for some 20 years. And while a list of his publications and his um, distinctions would be too long to go into here, um, I'd just like to name a few of his most distinguished uh, books, which include um, Translating Ireland from 1996, Translation and Identity from 2006, Translation and Globalization from 2013, and in 2017, Eco-Translation, Translation and Ecology in the Age of the Anthropocene. And I am overlooking a, a number of books which would be the, the prime output of many scholars. Professors, Professor Cronin is an, an extraordinarily prolific uh, um, as well as brilliant um, uh, a scholar in his field. So he also publishes in Irish, uh, has, has published a lot in Irish, including two bilingual volumes, Irish in the New Century on Gaelga Sanish Nua from 2005, and Irish and Ecology on Gaelga Agusan e from 2019. So I'm honored and delighted to have been invited to ask him some questions as part of this webinar. And I'm going to dive straight in and say, so Michael, I note that the chair of French you hold was endowed in 1776. Um, can you tell us something about that? Yes, um, uh, thank you very much um, for those very, very kind words, uh, Carol. Um, yeah, basically what happened is that the um, John Healy Hutchinson came in as provost in, in 1774, um, and he, he decided that the, the college needed a bit of kind of shaking up, and he was going to introduce all kinds of, of reforms. Um, so he begins, in, based in 1775, uh, he creates... Um, two teachers or professors, his, his words, um, of one for French and uh, German and the other uh, for Spanish and, uh, and, and Italian. And he did something that would be inconceivable uh, in our own times. He actually paid their salaries out of his own pocket. And so this gives you an idea of just how committed um, he was to the cause of, of modern languages. And fortunately for him and his bank account, um, George III steps in uh, a year later um, and sends him uh, a letter in October 1776 saying um, that he was recognizing these professorships in, in Trinity and that appropriate provisions would be made to pay these, uh, these professors. And basically Haley Hutchinson's um, idea it's kind of interesting because there is a sort of uh, a, a translation linked to it, um, was um, that 
Um, the young gentleman, of course, of course, it was an exclusively kind of male institution that, at that stage, um, that they, when they went on their grand tour of, of Europe, uh, would be kind of equipped linguistically um, to, uh, to deal with, you know, uh, to, to meet people, to talk to them, to, to find out about things and so on. But more particularly, um, and this is one of the things that was, was, was mentioned explicitly in, in, in one of the, the, the letters in connection with this, um, that they would no longer be dependent uh, on people of foreign extraction um for uh, for the translation um so it, and this to some extent was was um so it was kind of preoccupying a lot of people in the 17th and 18th century the, the idea that um if you were to kind of uh, subcontract uh, your linguistic services and, and be dependent on, on others to do the translation for you um then you made yourself kind of uniquely kind of vulnerable or dependent uh, on those people and how reliable were they uh, and, and and so on um so uh the the french set up a thing called the les enfants de langue you know where they they send children to uh, secondary school is still in Paris, so Louis Le Grand, um, and these uh, children learn uh, Arabic, uh, Persian, uh, Turkish. Uh, they dress in uh, the appropriate clothes. They eat uh, Turkish, uh, Persian, uh, Arab uh, food. They're sort of you know, kept from the other students. And then they go to the different consulates and embassies where they finish off the linguistic education. But the idea being um, that you could depend on your own subjects if you like to do the, the translation. The Portuguese had a slightly more original solution. Um, they created this thing called the exiles. The exiles are basically common law prisoners in Portuguese prisons who would be uh, given a reduction in their sentence if they agreed to live amongst the indigenous peoples in you know, what we now call uh, Brazil. Um, and they would acquire the language and then act as kind of intermediaries uh, or translators uh, for the, uh, the Portuguese uh, merchants and, uh, and settlers when they, when they came to, um, to that part of the, the so-called uh, new world. Um, so there's a kind of an interesting sort of translation context, if you like, uh, to what uh, Healy Hutchinson was doing there at the end of the 18th century. And that's something that's, I mean, it's, it sounds pretty topical to me as well, but also um, that's something you've written about before, right? The, the distinction between um, having interpreters who you say, suppose you invade a country and you have to find interpreters on site, you know, the, the, the difference between that and having your own cadre of interpreters that you bring with you. Um, uh, and I, I, there's something there sort of seems kind of fundamental about distrust, the distrust of the linguist, the distrust of the bilingual. I mean, is, do you think that's something that's at work there? Is that something that you... Yeah, I mean, I think something very, very, very um, powerful. William Jones uh, produced a very, very famous grammar of the, the Persian language at the end of the 18th century, a great kind of oriental scholar. And he, he in his kind of prefaces, one of the reasons that they, they, they that he produced this grammar was that he could teach um, English subjects to uh, teach them the Persian language. So they were no longer re 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 reliant on the uh, translating service, uh, services of people that they could not rely upon or could not uh, trust. Um, so that kind of, the, the, the notion of uh, developing, you know, this kind of autonomy through, through language learning was quite important because there, there was a kind of paradox that's always haunted, if you like, uh, empire. And this goes you know, right back to the time uh, of uh, Alexander the Great, um, is that on the one hand, you know, the, the famous adage that's attributed to Alexander was know who you govern. Um, so uh, in order to find out uh, all you can about you know, the, the, the subject peoples, um, you need to know their, their languages, you need to be able to translate, translate between their languages and let's say the, 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 the imperial language. Um, but so, um, because if you do that, um, you, uh, you have kind of an extensive intelligence network, so you can head off any potential dissent, rebellion and, and so on. Um, so that's, that's good and it can prove very effective. The problem is, of course, that uh, what constitutes your strength also constitutes your vulnerability, um, because there you can have the people who are acting as the mediators, the translators, and so on, um, because they're they're in this kind of uh, this in between uh, space. They've they've got divided loyalties. Uh, they um, find themselves um, uh, often kind of working for, for uh, potentially for 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 for, for two masters. Uh, so so that kind of the, the uh, recognition of the absolute necessity uh, of, of, of translation in order for the kind of imperial governance to, to work. Um, but at the same time, 
a deep unease uh, about what it is you're you're doing, and we see this to, to this 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 very day. About you know, a number of cases that came out of Guantanamo uh, Bay, where uh, translators and interpreters were accused of of, of double dealing. Uh, we see what's happening with the uh, Afghan interpreters who, who've been left behind, um, who um, either they or the, or the families uh, are subject um, to to torture and 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 worse because they seem to have betrayed the people. Uh, for uh, inciting with the the, the the coalition or the allied uh, forces, so um, there's a, a long kind of 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 of, of history uh, of this. In fact, in, in Shakespeare's history uh, plays, one of the, the characters, Jack Cade, um, who uh, turns up as this kind of rebellious uh, figure, uh, and of course you're told that Jack Cade had worked as an interpreter in Ireland during, during the, the wars in Ireland. And that there's something about his kind of duplicitous nature, which is both necessary uh, for uh, empire, but then of course he, he becomes a, a liability. Um, that duplicity plays out in a different uh, stage. So contest, contesting uh, the um, royal rule, uh, monarchical rule in, in England itself. And you've got, of course, a completely different example in something like Henry V, you know, where you have that, that those amazing scenes of the princess trying to learn uh, to learn English through a terrible, terrible teacher to um, you know, to have some hope of, of being able to establish some kind of working relationship with the man that she's supposed to marry. And then, of course, he turns out to have, um, you know, indifferent French. But um, go, coming back to this question of language learning, because I mean, obviously, this is a topic that I can I can see it's going to range over a wide range of, of, of things. But um, I, I'm, I'm sort of to bring it back to Trinity um, and in terms of Trinity as a, a center for language learning and language study over over many centuries. Um, are there different are there other ways in which translation then became important to the cultural life of Trinity or other ways in like high points or where, where tr translation has been very crucial to the development of the university? Yeah, I mean, I think it, what's very interesting about, about, about Trinity is that <clears throat> translation is, is absolutely there from the outset. I mean, when the, the petition is is put to uh, Elizabeth I you know, to have the, the college established. Um, you you have kind of three fellows who are named in this petition and three um, students. Um, and one of those three students um, is a man called uh, William Daniel in English, uh, William O'Donnell uh, in, in 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 Irish. Um, and he becomes uh, one of the, the the first group of students to start in Trinity uh, in, in 15, uh, the 9th of January, 1594. Um, and one of the things that he, he sets about uh, doing is translating uh, the New Testament uh, into, uh, into Irish because there's no um, New Testament, uh, uh, the New Testament is, not, is not available in the, uh, the Irish vernacular. Um, so he kind of, he, you know, he labors uh, away on this uh, translation and eventually it comes out in, in, in 16, uh, 1602. And what's kind of interesting is that, you know, in the, the kind of preface to this uh, translation, you know, he talks about, you know, doing this translation in what he calls on Colosh de Mua, so this new college just outside uh, outside Dublin. So he's kind of he's looking from this college at the walls of the city of of of, of Dublin, um, and he you know he produced this translation. Remember that the, the Battle of Kinsale is in 1601. So you know uh, he talks about the preface about you know how the forces of of, of darkness as he would see it uh, almost overcame the. Uh, the, the 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 enterprise, but what what um, O'Donnell says um, in his kind of introduction is that he sees you know he talks about the sort of the, the golden period of um, of Irish scholarship and you know uh, monks going backwards and forwards in the European continent between uh, England and, and Ireland, um, and he sees, so this kind of the saints and scholars uh, notion, um, but he sort of reappropriates that um, for the, the the Protestant Church, arguing. Um, that what Protestantism is doing in 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 Ireland, the the, the Reformation, is to bring um, <clears throat> Irish Christianity back to that kind of pristine, uh, pure uh, be, be beginnings, uh, and this is something that he, you know he sees his translation enterprise as, as as being part of. And it's interesting then that um, a provost who's appointed in 1627, um, uh, provost uh, Bedell, um, he is uh, someone who um, you know wants to continue. That he sees that the, the, the value uh, of this uh, connection, um, and he um, starts to work, uh, or he commissions somebody, a man called Martin King, to kind of work on the translation of the Old Testament 
uh, into, uh, into Irish. Um, but then, of course, what happens is the 1641 rebellion uh, breaks out. Um, he is trapped in, uh, in County Cavan with his, his two sons. He's arrested by the, the troops of the Confederation. Um, and a man called uh, Donacho Sheeradon, uh, who is uh, friends uh, with the uh, Catholic bishop who's uh, taken over the house that Bedell that is in because he's a Protestant bishop of Kilmore. Um, he, um, Donacho Sheeradon, um, manages to uh, rescue uh, the, uh, the manuscript. Uh, and uh, Adele gets a, a fever in, 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 in captivity. He's, he's buried uh, with full uh, on, military honours by the, the Confederation uh, troops. Um, and the, but the manuscript lays uh, eyes unpublished for, for years until the, the chemist, Robert Boyle, many of you will, have, will remember Robert Boyle from school days, um, but Robert Boyle uh, puts up the money to have the, uh, the Old Testament uh, published uh, in in 16, 1685. Um, so very, so what you get with these kind of these two um, Trinity kind of uh, scholars and and and, and the provost is a, a very acute sense that uh, translation is um, an essential part of you know whatever dialogue is going to occur. Uh, in in the, the society, and of course, it was, it was a very fraught one because, on the one hand, you had the kind of the uh, the religious uh, commitment to the notion of, of of conversion and to preaching to people directly uh, in their own uh, language, and the other um, a kind of um, a military imperative, which is to do with conquest of territory and so on, wasn't particularly interested in the notion of of of, of cultural dialogue. Um, so, but what we see in, in Trinity then is you, 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 people who are kind of negotiating these kind of lines of tension uh, between the, the different traditions and and, and and communities. And I think this is something that, you know, um, goes on through uh, through time. And in the, in the mid nineteenth century, um, Isaac. But you know who um, was the founding member of the Irish uh, Home Rule Party. Um, he uh, sets up a magazine, Dublin University uh, Magazine, which becomes um, a real kind of a hub uh, of um, kind of promotion uh, of uh, German uh, literature. And um, so, and so you've got a great uh, Irish poet, James Clarence Mangan, uh, who in 1836 he um, series. Of, of translations and, and, and commentaries, uh, Antalica uh, Germanica, where he uh, brings to the attention uh, of his readers um, people like Jean Paul, uh, Schiller, um, some of the lesser known uh, Goethe, and, and so on. First translation of Goethe's Faust into English, which goes through 19 uh, reprints uh, and was reprinted as early as 1985, was by John Anster, uh, who was a Entered Trinity in 1810, became professor of civil law in the 18 uh, in 1850, um, and and you know, he, so and, and Goethe himself um, said that he was this was a remarkable piece uh, of, of of work, and it was in Germany itself. <laughs> you know, Anster's translation were were, were reprinted uh, three 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 times, uh, and of course this um, we tend to forget because of the two world wars and legacy and so on. Um, but just how hugely significant German culture was to to the nineteenth century, um, and this is partly because the British royal family and the, the connections that they had there, uh, the fact that the uh, Prussians were allies. Uh, of English um, in the uh, Napoleonic uh, Wars, and of course that uh, Martin Luther, who is the you know the father of the uh, sort of described the father of the German language, is of course the translator. Um, so, uh, so what we find these these people you know uh, doing, um, but uh, Anster and then by association James Clarence Mangan is kind of mediating between these uh, these 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 different uh, traditions, and of course. To mentioned because this has been exclusively male confraternity that I've been talking about. Um, but one of John Anster's uh, close friends was uh, was Lady Jane Wilde, uh, Oscar Wilde's uh, mother. Uh, and of course, um, she was very, uh, I mean, she, she couldn't get an education in Trinity College, um, but she was um, very close to, very friendly with a lot of the scholars in, in, in the college. Um, and she, 
would, you know, sought assistance from a number uh, of them. And she was working on her translations for the nation uh, newspaper, where there they were using the tradition of Prussian nationalism uh, to uh, not advocate for you know, proximity to the crown, but rather on, on the contrary, uh, to uh, argue for the, the Irish uh, nationalist cause. And she would published in her translations of, of Lamartine, um, you know, uh, one of the, the, the minister, uh, ministers in the, the 1848 Republican government uh, in, in, in France. Um, so, um, so we get this kind of, you know, it, it's, it, there's a kind of, you know, a constant in, in, in the, 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 the college up to the, the, the foundation of the Trinity Centre for Literary and Cultural Translation uh, three years ago, um, is seeing the college, you know, where it is, in the heart of the city, you know, um, with William Daniel, we started outside the walls of the city, and now we're, we're very much in, 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 in the heart of it. Uh, but seeing translation itself as a, as a kind of, you know, uh, kind of plateau nantes, you know, a, a place where all of these um, languages and, and ideas and cultures uh, come, to, come together in very, very real ways. And th 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 I mean, that, that's fascinating. And there, I have all sorts of questions about that, which maybe we'll save for the Q&A a little bit further down. I can see that there are a few questions coming already, so we'll keep an eye on those. Um, I, I, just from a, from a personal interest, I wanted to jump forward in time and look at, uh, you know, one of the great translator linguists um, writers of the 20th century who studied languages at, um, uh, at Trinity being Samuel Beckett, you know, and then went on to make this, this very interesting to, to choose to write in a language that wasn't his own. I don't know whether you, um, that that question of writing, the, 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 the to write in a language that, that you feel belongs to you or a language that you literally, where you feel that somehow your identity is at a remove. I don't know if that's something you'd like to say something yeah, about. Uh, yeah, just the other day, I, I was at the launch of an Irish language translation of uh, Happy Days. And of course, Happy Days comes out in French, Les Bourgeois, uh, then, uh, it's translated um, by Beckett's Happy Days, and there was this uh, an Irish language translation that's recently been um, made by Michal um, And But what what kind of struck me as I was at that launch was um, how appropriate <laughs> this was, and some because you know there's a there's a great line in all that fall um, where uh, Mrs. Rooney says, "Ah, alas, our, our our own poor Gaelic." You know, she she you kind of references. That. And I, I think to some extent that um, uh, the, the Beckett's, this kind of moving you know, between uh, languages, the kind of, um, that there was something uh, uh, about it for me um, that for an Irish writer, it's, it's, it seems as if this, this notion of being in a kind of perpetual state of translation um, is something that's in, in many ways um, very interesting and appropriate. I mean, uh, Joyce's famous line about you know fretting in the shadow of another man's language you know when when young Stephen meets the dean of studies um in, in Newman House um but I think that that you know for 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 for, for Beckett that decision um to write in an, another uh, language and then subsequently uh, to engage in the process of you know translating um into English. I'm, I'm not going to say back into English because you know it, it was written in in in, in French. Um, and the sense in which you know, looking at, at, at Beckett's um, French text and looking at his his his, his English uh, text, and I, and I don't want to kind of overstate this, but I but I think you, you, there, there's a certain kind of you know what he used to call in in, in the the uh, the olden days a Hibernian flavor, you know, to to the uh, to 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 the English, which is kind of interesting to speculate on. But then, of course, there's not just I mean. The, the self-translation, which opens up all kinds of, you know, extraordinarily interesting questions about the relationship between the, the translator uh, and the author, and the author is the translator, you know. Um, but um, I, I think it's also in the case of his his own translations, you know, his his, his translations from uh, Rambo uh, and uh, other, um, uh, or uh, his, his, his famous uh, translation of Guillaume Apollinaire's Zone. Um, and it's this, this, the extent to which um, he, and he, he's a little, he, 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 somewhat like Ezra Pound in this respect, you know, is there's almost a slight like kind of uh, arch, uh, archaic tendency, the kind of diction that, that, that Beckett uses in, in those translations. Um, and it, in, in some ways, he, he does seem to um, echo what the um, translation uh, scholar uh, Lawrence Venuti talks about, you know, when he, when he talks about this, you know, resisting the, the, the temptation to kind of um, turn everything, you know, into a kind of a smooth, 
uh, vernacular kind of idiom where everything gets domesticated and, and all the as asperities, all the rough bits are taken out uh, and it reads as if it was written in English. Uh, whereas you, 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 you see in Beckett's uh, translations, um, when he's translating uh, uh, other works, is um, there, there, there is a sense of estrangement. There's a, certain, there's a, there's a kind of oddness um, to his, uh, to, to, to the translations that, that he produces. Uh, but it seems to me that in what he was doing um, in, you know, uh, living in these, uh, these two language uh, worlds, um, that I, it, it seems to me that it, it's a kind of, uh, it's a state of being, it's, it's, it's a way of being um, that resonates, I think, quite strongly uh, with um, you know what Thomas Kinsler calls the the, the dual tradition that 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 sense of of kind of you know moving in and being ghosted by uh, other uh, language zones and and, and cultural uh, cultural realities. I mean the the thing about Beckett when he was uh, you know teaching in the, in, in our in the French department here in in Trinity um, is that he was famous almost for his non-translation fact that he I, I remember. Um, a, a former colleague of mine speak. His mother studied uh, under Beckett here in Trinity, and that um, the what she remembered most about his lectures was not what he said, but what he didn't say. <laughs> so he would just simply look out the window for uh, very long periods of time as the students were kind of <laughs> they were twiddling their thumbs, wondering what was going to 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 to, to happen 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 next. Um, but uh, he, he certainly um, is, is somebody that is very interesting in, 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 in problematizing uh, the notion of what it is to translate. Yeah, and we might, we might come back to that because Beckett's endless and interesting, but I, I just, uh, picking up then what you were saying about recently going to a, a launch of um, Ole Bonjour into, into Irish. And I, I just, this reminded me, I've been living away from, I mean, I, I graduated from Trinity in the mid nineties and then have lived away ever since basically. And um, and I the, the Ireland that I remember growing up with in terms of learning Irish and the kinds of translations that were available in Irish, um, it see, there seems to be an enormous, enormously greater diversity now of, um, of, of, of the kinds of things that are being translated into Irish. And I just wondered, I mean, that's my own very crude sort of impression from browsing in bookstores and, and reading on social media. And I don't know if you'd like to maybe say something about whether you feel that the tradition of the kinds of policies of what kinds of things end up in Irish, whether there have been sort of nuances and development in that over the years. Yeah, I mean, I think what's fair to say is if you if you look at the the, the early years of the, of the state and, and when the, the kind of the state publishing uh, house on, on, on Goom sort of founded in, in, in 1927 and they, and they set up this kind of translation scheme. Um, I mean, it, it was a kind of Quite uh, an enterprising uh, translation scheme. By the, you know, by the time you get to 1939, about 120 titles uh, in in print, um, and about you know, one third of those are drawn from um, from European uh, languages, and they're kind of direct, you know, directly translated from European languages into in, into Irish. And I argued in translation in Ireland, I think that um, this is quite an important influence on the development, particularly of prose fiction in Ireland in, in the post Second World War uh, period. Uh, but the majority of the books uh, were, of course, uh, translations from um, English. Uh, now, very uh, effective and, and considered to be kind of small translation masterpieces, the translation of Dracula, the translation of, of Great Expectations. You had some of the greatest Irish language writers, the Pierce, Charles McLean, Martin O'Kine, working uh, on these uh, translations. Um, but the, the thing was that you know, most Irish could access those in the original language. So it was kind of slightly pointless exercise. And it tended to, the books themselves tend to re reflect the kind of the, the reading tastes of the kind of the Victorian uh, bourgeoisie um, and weren't you know, particularly uh, innovative. I mean, the, the translations themselves were quite innovative, but, but not the, the, the actual, um, the range of what they were saying, but this really changes. I, I think in the um, uh, the late nineteen eighties, throughout the nineteen nineties, into the present uh, period, and I think it's to do with what I see as the uh, one of the curious effects of of, of, of globalization when, when it really begins to sort of impact in Ireland uh, in a fairly forceful way uh, from the nineteen nineties. Uh, Ireland's always been you know, globalized because of its diasporic um, communities, but. 
but the economic globalization how it becomes part of that um, sphere um, it, it, it on the one hand I think produces the sort of the um, very much the the kind of centripetal the the idea of being closer to, to, to Boston than, than, than Berlin, to quote a famous <laughs> a saying from the time. Um, and that's certainly true. There was the, Ireland's very um, close incorporation of the Anglosphere. Um, but I think it produced a kind of a, a, another reaction, which is more kind of a, you know, a centrifugal one, um, which was um, a kind of a revaluing um, of you know, the, the language, the culture. So, Hence, we get the creation of, of, of TG Car, we get the huge increase in the number of Wales Scotland and so on. And of course, this then re reflects itself in a much more, uh, much broader uh, scope in terms of the, the literature and the material that's getting translated uh, into, in, into Irish from, from, from other languages. I mean, Joyce famously said that the shortest uh, road to Tara is through Hollyhead. Um, and very, very often, it seems to me, it was partly the experience of kind of expats and people had left and um, that they coming back and kind of perhaps valuing uh, more um, what they'd either taken for granted or they'd had a bad experience of, you know, through you know, poor teaching or, you know, um, the compulsory nature of the subject and, and, and so on. Um, so I think that, so what we're getting now is, yes, it's a much uh, greater openness that's, that, that's coming um, and it's reflected in these, these translations. Sorry, I'm just unmuting myself. Yeah. So um, I, I wanted to, I, I'm just aware that there are sort of doors shutting in my, in my background that I didn't want people to be uh, to be bored by. But um, I, I wanted to, to move on now to your work's been focused on ecology and issues of the environment for a number of years now. Um, how do you, can you tell us a bit about how you feel translation is implicated in this? Yeah, I, th I think translation is, is, is implicated in this in a, a number of ways. Um, I think the first way is, is to do with just with, with linguistic diversity, um, you know, one of the things that you find um, uh, is, um, you know, we have a, a critical problem around the, the decline of, of biodiversity, and we're all aware of this, and a great deal of discussion of, you know, uh, what's happened to wild bees, what's happened to insects, what's happened to uh, flora and, and fauna, and a catastrophic uh, drop in the number of species. Um, but I, I'm trying to remember the last time that I read, you know, a serious feature piece in uh, a newspaper or listened to something broadcast media about the catastrophic decline in the number of the world's uh, languages. Um, because you know, some of the, the estimates are saying that we're, we're losing uh, a language every two weeks, some uh, and uh, every month, and that by the end of the 21st century, uh, we will have lost something like 86% of the languages on the planet. Of course, every time one of those languages dies, a whole world goes with it, but more importantly, a whole world of understanding one's place in the natural world goes with it. So uh, one of the crucial tools uh, for uh, the preservation and maintenance of, of biodiversity is the human languages that have been used to uh, construct, uh, in, engage with, uh, develop and sustain that diversity. Because if, if you destroy the land, you, you deprive uh, humans of some of those important tools they have to, um, to, to deal with that. So I think that's the, the first uh, thing. The second is, and this is thinking about, we, we call our centre in, in Trinity, the Trinity Centre for Literary and Cultural uh, Translation. Um, and I, I, I like to think about that in, in, the, in the broadest uh, possible sense, which is that one, one of the, the real dilemmas that we have at present um, is, you know, how to reimagine or how to uh, re-engage um, with the, the natural world of which we are part. In other words, how we, we think about our relationship um, to all of the other uh, species that are, are around us. Because um, if we ignore them, and COVID is a spectacular example of this, um, these organisms are extraordinary agency. They have extraordinary power. Look at look how they've impacted uh, on, our, on our lives and look what's, what's going to happen going into the future. So, uh, so what that means then is you have to think about um, cross-species relationality, how, how you think about, you know, uh, how are we going to relate in a meaningful way uh, to, and that for me is the translation problem. It's, a, it's about translation across difference. I mean, I'm currently um, just starting on, on a project uh, with um, colleagues in 
in zoology, uh, engineering, um, uh, botany, um, and looking at the impact of wind turbines uh, on um, the kind of uh, birds, uh, insects, the, the, the various kind of populations that around the wind turbines. Um, so they, my colleagues using these incredibly sophisticated sensors to be able to get uh, to register movements and flight paths and, you know, uh, but you know, uh, my sort of input into the team uh, with a postgraduate student is to look at how do we uh, understand what it is that we're, we're, we're getting, that we're, you know, when we get these signals, and also uh, how do we then translate uh, certain things that we need to say, like we need to warn birds uh, on flight paths about the presence of wind turbines and so on. So how are we going to translate that into a language that, that is intelligible for species that are radically different from us. And um, so this is another way, perhaps a, a less expected way, uh, that I think translation fits into the picture. Thank you. Thank you very much for that again. Um, I, uh, there are, I have more questions that I haven't been able to answer, but to, to ask yet, but I, I'm also aware that we have an increasing number of questions building up in the Q&A. So I think we'll move on to that. And we're going to, I think I'm going to hop around a bit in the questions. So apologies to those of you who not everybody may get their question answered and apologies for that, but I'll try and, and, and we'll get to as many as possible. So I have um, I have a question here from Margaret Marshall, a classics graduate of 1955 in, in, in Trinity and um, asking about what, can you say something about translations from the classics, including the issue that with fewer people now studying Greek and Latin and therefore studying the classics in translation, um, but also, as I, just to add to Margaret's question, you know, that, that sense that there was a period in which a sort of golden age of, of translation from Greek and Latin with tremendous skill, you know, by, I mean, I, I don't know if we would expect undergraduates today, you know, to be able to translate from Greek and Latin with the same kind of, 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 of skill as would have been shown 100 years ago, but maybe you could say something about that. Yeah, no, I mean, I think one of the things that's, 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 that's um, very, very important is um, I, th I think in terms of the, the classical tradition, classical translations is, 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 is two things. I mean, the, the first is um, I, one thing that's often forgotten is that between um, the 1450s and let's say the 1650s, there were 1,500 works uh, of uh, a, an intellectual or discursive nature uh, that were published um, by Irish uh, authors in, in, in Latin. Um, so, all of the major kind of intellectual debates of the period, the kind of the political or religious debates, uh, were primarily conducted in, in, in Latin. And these uh, are engaged in these uh, debates, in, including uh, many scholars from this uh, university. Um, but because uh, these works have, have not been translated, because people are not learning that, this whole uh, chunk of our, uh, our history is completely invisible. You know? And, uh, uh, you know, a history that was so important in terms of these were very high level uh, debates. So, so you, you get a, a completely truncated um, version uh, of Irish intellectual uh, history if you subtract this um, important part. In terms of the classical translations, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the um, what you find um, there's a wonderful man called uh, Edward uh, Wheatonhall, um, who was um, a fellow uh, of, of, of Trinity uh, College Dublin. He uh, was one of the successors to Bedell uh, as uh, Bishop of, of Kilmore. Um, and as a wonderful, he, he, you know, he, he then kind of went on the, 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 the law circuit uh, because he could only be fellow for, for a certain number of, of, of years. And um, he, uh, but so he talks about it. This, this goes back to 1675 and um, he's, um, translating uh, Juvenal uh, into, uh, into, into English, uh, and he wants to do kind of a poetic uh, rendition uh, of it. Um, and um, he, he talks about, you know, he, so he finishes his legal business in Flamel, um, and then he, he goes to Kilkenny, where he's kind of staying for the night. Um, and there, he, you know, he, he's the script, you know, he has all these, he, he, the three different translations of, of, of Juvenal's um, 10 satire. Um, kind of spread on, on, on his bed and he's, and he's comparing the different versions to see um, how you know he will he will render this um, most uh, most most effectively um, and it's, and one of the things that he kind of he, he mentioned sort of in passing is that um, you know uh, English is, uh, is is a much more kind of suitable 
uh, language uh, for doing these uh, this, this poetic translation than French, because French becomes the kind of the arch linguistic uh, enemy. Um, and there is um, another man called Wentworth Dillon, who again was a kind of cl a classical uh, translator, um, who um, he translated um, Horace uh, into, uh, in, in, into English, and in his 1733 translation, he dedicates it to the uh, fellows and scholars uh, of, of Trinity uh, College. Um, but again, what he emphasizes is um, that uh, whereas the, uh, the, the French have this kind of flowery, uh, fancy language that's not fit for kind of proper men, um, that, you know, English is that sort of manly uh, language and he's going to produce uh, this uh, translation. But of course, he was a very close friend of the, the great English poet uh, John Dryden. He was one of the first people to say what an extraordinary text uh, Milton's uh, Paradise uh, Lost was. Um, and the only surviving uh, portrait uh, of Wentworth uh, Dillon is in the collection of, of Princess Diana's, um, the late Princess Diana's brother, uh, Earl Spencer. So uh, one sort of, we have this uh, classics uh, translator you know, who's connected with, with Trinity College Dublin. So, I mean, right throughout uh, the 18th and 19th century, you have a very, very um, distinguished group of, of scholars and, and translators. Thank you. And, and I, just to pick up, there's a related question from Kenneth Gannon, which is about what, what are your views about new translations of ancient texts, for instance, Wilson's translation of the Odyssey. So thinking also about gender as well as the perceived need to engage with current perspectives. Yeah, I think to some extent, the one thing to always remember about uh, translations is um, that, you know, you know, unlike um, their um, the original text from which they're translated, um, they, they, they change and they age. You know, the, the one thing about uh, translations is they're not the picture of Dorian Gray. You, you can't keep a translation up in an attic forever, you know, uh, because what's going to happen is that eventually somebody, something will happen and the, uh, the picture will, will change. Is so that basically um, translations, why we have uh, translations over and over again is that translations uh, are, uh, at the end of the day, primarily for their target audiences. They, 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 the reason that the translation in the first place is a perceived lack in the culture, something we need to know, something we need to, 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 to learn about. Um, and then when it comes into uh, that culture, um, it doesn't come into a neutral space. It doesn't, it isn't a kind of tabula rasa, it's a culture um, that's all kinds of uh, assumptions and prejudices and values and so on. Um, so, that's what translations do. They, they, they're, they're very much, if you like, um, living organisms, you know? So, um, so the, the retrans, you know, that, that, that great movement to, to retranslate the classics that E.V. Rue uh, sets in, in motion for Penguin Classics uh, in 1946 with his translation of, of the Odyssey. Um, this is something that um, spreads to so many different uh, areas. And um, so, you know, each age gets its post, each age gets its Shakespeare, each age gets its, 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 its Homer. And that very much, I think, reflects the conditions of the time. It's just why it's so interesting to, to read translations. When you read translations, um, it's almost like a, um, a kind of stunned as mirror being held up to a society. And it reflects so many of the, the kind of the assumptions, the debates, uh, the tensions, the conflicts uh, within, within the society. And that actually leads us beautifully into another question by Cormac O'Cullinoin, which is a name I recognize uh, with great joy because uh, Cormac was one of my tutors. Great translation of, of uh, translation yes. of Boccaccio. <laughs> yes, and, and, and the translator of Boccaccio and, um, and somebody who has thought a lot about these exact questions that, you're, um, that, you, that you were just uh, looking at now. And he, his question is, literary translations can be made to enrich the reader's culture or the culture of the new language or even in some way, the cultural life of the original language or the original author. What's the relationship between these three potential benefits? So these, so um, it's the, the author, the... To, to enrich the reader's culture or the culture of the new language, or maybe even the culture in some way of the original language or the original author. Right, yeah. Um, if we could start with the first two. I mean, one of the things that we, f we find um, as kind of part of, of, of cultural history in the West, is that at, at moments um, when there is 
you know, a, a significant growth or a, expansion. You know? So um, whether it's the, uh, the Romans, you know, expanding their, uh, their, 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 their empire, uh, whether it's uh, in, in Islam in, with, with the development of the Umayyad and then the Abbasid uh, caliphates, uh, whether it's 16th century uh, England, 17th century France, 18th century Germany, is that all of those moments are great translation ages. Huh? Um, because, um, now it's, it's, because part of the idea is that if you're going to um, in, you know, create this language that's sort of fit for, for, for purpose, right? so it's fit for this kind of great cultural uh, and territorial, of course, imperial expansion, is that you must set about uh, translating um, all that is uh, valuable and, and useful and, and, and so on. But the idea is not so much um, the idea of, of kind of creating then a sense of perpetual indebtedness or dependency, uh, but rather it's, it, it's kind of turned in its head. And the idea is that our language is so great, it is so capacious that it can take in uh, all of these texts and writers uh, and authors from, from different languages. And, and this, of course, is what the... Um, the Elizabethan the Tudors will say about their uh, their 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 English is what the the French uh, will say in, in the late seventeenth century is what the Germans will say uh, in the late eighteenth century and, and and so on. So the, the idea that the um, the, the language is um, greatly in, enriched, strengthened, uh, fortified by, but of course alongside that there's. Um, the unease, the unease that we talked about right at the beginning of our, of our conversation, which is, um, you know, the denunciation, for example, in Tudor times, what we call inkhorn terms. And inkhorn terms were um, these terms that came in from Latin or from Greek or from French or from Italian, which were seen to kind of undermine kind of, you know, good, solid kind of Saxon core of the, uh, of, 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 of the language. Um, but I, I think more broadly, there, there's, there's always a perception in those periods of, of translation as something that is uh, deeply, uh, deeply enriching. In terms of the, uh, the, the, you know, what happened to the author uh, in the, um, the source culture, um, the or source language, um, the French philosopher Jacques Derrida said, um, you know, what makes uh, you, a text famous um, is not so much <laughs> its status as an original, but its status as a translation. Like when we when we talk, you see the, the, the common version of that on the back of kind of best-selling paperbacks is translated into twenty-five languages or twenty, you know, translated into uh, forty languages worldwide. You know? um, but it's the idea that you know um, that a Shakespeare uh, or a Proust or a Dante or a Rilke um, that they um, their, their reputation rests on the fact that they are so widely translated. In other words, in, in, in a paradoxical way, not so much their originality as their translatability uh, that makes them, makes them famous. It's one of those kind of paradoxes uh, of, of, of translation. But of course, what you find so often uh, in those uh, writers, like the ones um, that, 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 that I've, 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 I've mentioned, I mean, um, how indebted uh, Proust was, for example, um, to the experience of translating uh, John Ruskin with his with his mother. Um, his mother, incidentally, did most of the work. She was much better at, at English than Proust was. Um, but uh, oh, sorry, I think. Yeah, well, indeed. <laughs> but um, you, but time and time and again, we we we, we find how indebted uh, writers are uh, to to translations. I mean, the way in which. You know, Martin Akhain is in, in, in a prison camp in County Kildare and he discovers the Russian classics in translation. And this leads to this, this great post-war uh, flowering uh, of his, his talent and, and books like, you know, like Train Akila. So it's, it, it's a, a long story in history uh, of that. Um, Thank you very much. I think I know that there's a lot more that could be said to that question. Um, I thought we maybe might have one last question. Um, uh, uh, or, or maybe I, we might squeak in too, but I, again, I apologize to the, the, the wonderful questions that have been asked and not all of which we'll, we'll have time to answer. But um, could you say something about the contemporary relevance of translation to Trinity? Yeah, I mean, I think in 1962, um, the health board in, in, in Dublin uh, recorded the need or 
engage with, with, with 14 different languages. Um, the latest uh, can for the HSE for the sort of the Eastern uh, region is, uh, is 168. Um, basically, um, what's happened to the city of Dublin in the last uh, 20, 30 years has been a spectacular uh, growth in the linguistic makeup uh, of the uh, the city, I mean, for 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 any of you who've, who've walk around uh, this uh, this this city, you get on the bus, you get on the tram, or, and you hear Brazilian Portuguese, you hear Lithuanian, you hear Polish. You know, there, there's so many different languages. So, um, so I think the, one of the ways that we conceive of of the centre uh, here in in Trinity as a, as, as a, as a point of contact. Uh, with this kind of linguistic diversity. The, the reason uh, that we've um, in, invited in uh, translators, uh, poets, uh, writers, uh, in so many uh, of the different languages, so everything from Polish to, uh, to Yoruba, um, is um, to, to create that, that sense of, of interface that, that you know, uh, we value uh, your language uh, and 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 your your, your culture, um, and that you know, this is an important part. It's always been an important part of the makeup of Trinity, um, uh, and and to some extent, this the centre is, is trying to, to 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 amplify that to to emphasise the the significance and importance uh, of that 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 interface. I think another um, dimension to it is as well, and this is really going all the way back to. Um, the, the, that first student uh, on the 9th of January, uh, 1594, uh, William O'Donnell, William Daniel, um, is um, kind of showcasing uh, what uh, is happening in, 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 in Irish literature and how this has been brought into uh, different uh, languages. We had a wonderful uh, event the other evening with uh, Colm Tobin, his, his new book, The Magician, about Thomas Mann. Um, and so we had his, his French, um, his Polish and his Greek uh, translators sort of in conversation with him. And it's just fascinating to see, you know, what happens when uh, different books and, and some of, of, of Con Tobin's books are, are very firmly rooted in, in aspects of Irish culture. And, and what happens then when they, when they go into uh, Polish translation into Greek translations or into uh, translation into, into French. And so to see what happens um, when you know the, the the languages of of Ireland, the literatures of Ireland, um, they go on their own uh, translation odyssey in different parts of the world. So I think the the, the way in which I I, I see the the, the, the centre here is uh, very much uh, acting uh, as this sort of meeting point or a kind of uh, a point of convergence um, between. Uh, all of the, the the languages and cultures that are are, are, are coming in, uh, and then the way in which uh, Irish uh, literature is, is not to be seen just in you know the specific context of of the island of Ireland, um, but this this great global presence that it it it, it achieves you know through the, the the good work of agencies like uh, Literature Ireland uh, uh, that are housed uh, in the uh, in, in in the centre in, in, in Binion's Street. So. Um, and this, you know, it seems to me is is a mission that is very much uh, true to, you know, that, that that kind of broadness that that Healy Hutchinson had envisaged in in, in the 1770s, uh, and you know, who was was there right at the inception uh, of of the college at the end of the the, the, the 16th uh, century. And this may be an, an, a nice point to mention. There's a comment here in the Q and A from Darren McGee. Um, uh, saying that even song will be sung in Irish in College Chapel today and most Wednesdays, a living example of the development of those New Testament translations in the Anglican tradition mentioned earlier. So again, that lovely sense, which, which I think wasn't, I mean, I was studying languages at Trinity, you know, so I wasn't, um, I was in a multilingual environment and very conscious of that, but I don't think I thought of the wider campus as a multilingual environment. And I'd love to think that if I, you know, went back and visited Trinity now, that there would be that, I mean, certainly the city feels like a multilingual space. And, you know, and, and I would love to, I mean, I, I would love to hear even song, song, um, uh, song um, uh, in, in, in the chapel. Um, and my understanding is that there's, there's also, there's, a, there's the centre, but there's also the possibility of postgraduate study at, in literary yes. translation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, we, we have uh, one of the few, Dedicated programs, um, master's programs in 
in, 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 in Europe, uh, in, in, in literary translation here at, um, in the, the, the center. So it's the MPhil uh, in, in literary translation. And um, so we welcome literary students from, from, from all over the world who, who come to the, uh, to the center. So that, that creates a great sense of, you know, um, you know, activity in our nation and, and, and enthusiasm, and to some extent, I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, I, I mentioned Provost Bedell there, um, the province 1627 was responsible for the translation of the Old Testament into into Irish, and, and was very keen on having, you know, um, service uh, and can service in Irish in the um, in, in 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 the, the college. Um, but one of the things um, that he he was, he was a very good friend of Sir Henry Wotton, um, who was a, an English ambassador to, to, to Venice and one of John Donne's, the, the poet's uh, closest uh, friends. Um, but one of the things that, that Bedell uh, talked about in, in, in one of his letters um, was um, he, he, he talked about the Trinity as kind of the, um, the, 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 the active point uh, in a turning sphere. You know? like, so he had this, this, this notion that it, not the kind of... <laughs> Notion of stasis or something still, but but something that was in motion as other things were in motion uh, around it. So a kind of Keplerian view uh, of uh, the possibilities of, of education and, and, and culture. And he, um, he of course, he, he realized that in, in a very vivid way in, in his own life. But I like to think that the you know the, the kind of postgraduate education that that that, that we offer is, is is continuing on, if you like, in in, in that spirit. Um, I know that we're we're coming up to time a bit. Um, I I just wanted to so the the the, the, the turning sphere thing just it, it brought a memory back to me as a as an alumna of of the Pomodoro. It was Pomodoro, no, the the in front of the Berkeley the Berkeley Library, um, and, uh, and and the turning sphere there. But um, I'm reluctant to I'm reluctant to to um, start on any of the the remaining questions. But I there's something I kind of want to just I, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to take my my um, my role as as a moderator um, and and sneak in a sort of comment question, which is that you've talked a lot about history and the history of translation, which is something that also greatly interests me. And the the the, the, the vivid details that you've come up with from various aspects of of the um, of, of, of Trinity's history and wider Irish history speak to the importance of the, the, the preservation and also the, the kind of sense of surprise you might feel that these docu that documents with this information that in some cases handwritten manuscript letters have come down to us. Um, uh, and I, I, don't, I mean, I, I suppose I just really wanted to express my wonder and, and gratitude to the archivists and librarians who make it possible for researchers like you and like to some extent like myself to do the, this kind of work. And of course, of which Trinity Library is a brilliant example. Yes, exactly. I, I remember when I was doing my translation history book, I remember the sense of emotion and excitement at, at, at looking at some of the, 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 the first consignment of, of books that came into the college in, in, um, in, in the early um, 1590s and to be handling those. And of course, many of them uh, were classical translations to go back to the question that was asked uh, earlier. So a very long, and so it's it's so, you know, to be in the, uh, the early printed books room in, 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 in the library and to, to, to sense this connection with the, that translation history that goes back so long, but is preserved thanks to the excellent work of our librarians and, and archivists are absolutely right um, about that class. Well, we'll stop there. Um, I, would, I would just like to thank Michael wholeheartedly for a conversation whose only tiny flaw was that it's been too short. <laughs> um, and I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And uh, I'll hand you all back to Susanna. Thank you very much for attending today. It's been such a pleasure to have both of you on today. Uh, really so much that I've learned just listening to the two of you. And uh, as you said, Carol, it would have been great for us to go on even longer. Um, so thanks again for, for taking all the time today. Thanks to my colleague, uh, Alex Owens, who's been behind the scenes helping to make this webinar a success. And also thanks to all of you, um, our alumni and friends who have been watching and participating today. We really appreciate this community that we've built together um, over the, the past year and a half through this webinar series. Um, if you'd like more information about Trinity Center for Literary and Cultural Translation, you can find the website at the bottom of the screen. I will also be sending that out to you um, in the follow-up email. And if you have any questions about uh, this webinar series or any other questions for the alumni office, please email us at alumni at tcd.ie.
In two weeks time, we will have uh, another Inspiring Ideas at Trinity webinar on uh, Wednesday, the 3rd of November at 1 p.m. Another fascinating topic. I'm looking forward to, to uh, attending this one on the genomic history of Ireland, how our genetic past informs our present. We have two excellent speakers, Dan Bradley, the Professor of Molecular Population Genetics at Trinity College Dublin, and Laura Cassidy, Assistant Professor of Molecular Population Genetics at Trinity College Dublin. We'll be sending out the invitation for that webinar in about a week's time. Uh, thanks again for participating and please stay safe.